Greetings, emergency departments across British Columbia. Sign your charts. You've reached your end of shift. You're listening to End of Shift, the podcast brought to you by the BC Emergency Medicine Network. I'm your host, Eric Angus, along with my friend and colleague, Joe Hager, bringing you an eclectic mix of clinical pearls and discussions about the philosophy and practice of our craft and yours, emergency medicine. This is episode number eight of End of Shift, Emergency Point of Care Ultrasound, in probes we trust. We will be talking to Dr. Karin Badrakirian, who's a staff emergency physician at the Lionsgate Hospital in North Vancouver and St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver. We're going to have a conversation about point-of-care ultrasound in general, its benefits and limitations, and more specifically, its applications to the emergency department patient flow and timely, accurate diagnosis. I'd like to introduce Karin, who I've known for quite some time. She goes by a couple of different monikers. Her hip-hop name is K-Bad. <laughs> she's also known as Coach Badra because there's some people that feel that she's an excellent teacher. I happen to be one of them. I sometimes use her initials and just call her KBQ for short. Kareen, tell me and tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, first of all, is there much explanation to do when you have such a long, difficult-to-pronounce name Karine Badra Kirion, that's much too much of a handful or a mouthful for Anglophones. So I had to shorten it to just Karine Badra, but even that's pretty complex. So the KBAD, um, I feel is just way easier. Uh, so KBAD does the trick, KBQ as well. Um, so have your pick. All right. Well, I just tend to use Karine because I think it's got a slightly, it's got a formal aspect to it, but it's still intimate. I like that. Great. We'll go by Kareen for tonight. Tell me, well, tell us all about yourself, where you trained, why you're doing what you do. So if it's not obvious yet, I'm ESL. I'm a former French Quebecer, but I saw the light 10 years ago, Eric, and came to BC for family practice residency, thinking I would just pick up and go after my two years. Uh, but, you know, life changes and fell in love with Emerge, stayed behind for the Emerge program and stuck around since then. So here I am. And shortly within my training, I thought, what the heck? I need more skills. So picked up my bags again and moved east to do my fellowship and came back to bring back some skills and um, bring it forth and teach it to my colleagues and learners. Are you still part of the ultrasound fellowship program at St. Paul's Hospital? Through some way, shape, or form. Uh, this year, I had uh, another opportunity pop up and uh, have been involved with the CCFPEM planning committee. So I've stepped down for a little bit, but I do still teach uh, remotely for uh, the coastal program here at uh, Lionsgate Hospital and still trying to run some courses, although in this uh, COVID climate, it's been a little challenging. All right. Well, Joe and I are going to alternate questions as we do. So I just wondered if you even carry a stethoscope anymore. Do you ever use that tool in your clinical practice? Such a great question, because I feel ever since the advent of COVID, it's become ever so more relevant a question. And my stethoscope, being another fomite that just hangs around my neck, um, is now stashed away in my locker. Every so often, I'll bring it out to listen to the occasional wheeze and say, you know, try to determine a PRAM score for the asthmatic patient. But for most everything else, there is POCUS. And so POCUS is a way to go for my physical exam. It's essentially an extension of my physical exam. I'm the same as you. I put away my stethoscope. Like it's a fomite that hangs around my neck. And I'm going to say that all, most of us have abandoned our stethoscopes. We're kind of like looking at the respiratory status clinically. And the RTs are still listening. And that's good enough for me. So um, I'm with you there. Don't you feel that... Even some of the physical exam um, 
or some of the physical examinations that you're taught in med school can also just be replaced by POCUS, some of which were really challenging. I mean, I can think of a few that even when I was learning as a medical student, I thought, I'm just never going to pick up the skill. For instance, finding ascites by doing this fluid wave test. Oh, yeah, totally right. I would agree with that. That's true, that fluid wave thing. So I'm curious, how do you guys check reflexes without a stethoscope? Like, that's what I use mine for. I'm pretty sure that Dr. Badra at my hospital would be terrified if I was using a delicate linear transducer probe to smack on people's knees and ankles. You use the abdominal probe, obviously. It's, it works great. For, it works great for reflexes. What are you talking about? Please don't do that. Don't shatter the crystals in the probe. That's rule of engagement number one of using POCUS. All right. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Joe, those probes cost about a hundred bucks each, right? They're not cheap. Yeah. Yeah. Just a hundred dollars. No big deal. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for... Actually, that's an interesting point about if there's anything else in terms of things that you would use POCUS for that you would never use anything for. However, I'm still pretty happy to use them to listen to cardiac murmurs, but we'll let you talk about that. All right, Joe, your question. My question is, do you know which emergency department in BC was the first one to have or to bring in POCUS. We're talking like 20 to 25 years ago. Is this a trick question? Is this it's, my reappointment it's not. question? It's, no, it's not. It's a surprise. It's a surprise question. And I know you won't know the answer. So I wanted to give a shout out to Urbane Ip. Who, oh, yes! Uh, Urbane Ip brought in ultrasound to BC. And I was the chief of the eMERGE back in the day at uh, Royal Columbian Hospital. And, um, and Urbane and I were on a bunch of committees together, you know, a section of emergency medicine. We met all the time because we were basically hospitals just across the, the bridge. So Urbane brought it in. And then very shortly afterwards, I brought it in. So the first hospital was Surrey. And then the second hospital was Royal Columbian. And it was basically a big war because they had the Diagnostic Accreditation Committee, which was loaded with radiologists and cardiologists. And it became a, a big fear of those groups that, that um, POCUS would basically uh, cut into their, to the income. And they were also worried about quality. But we managed to get it going. And it spread slowly for five years and then like wildfire about five to ten years later. With POCUS, what would you say like to eMERGE docs that the best yield POCUS studies are? Like the ones you get your best bang for the buck? I would say definitely for the dyspneic patient, finding or diagnosing acute pulmonary edema. First of all, the dyspneic patient is such a common presentation in our department And it is such a quick test to perform if you just have a quick look at the heart, a quick look at the lungs, and then if you can, and you're able to see the IVC to corroborate those findings. And it can share so many examples of patients whereby they presented either in septic shock or just dyspnea NYD, uh, whereby POCUS just helped change everything uh, in a matter of seconds. Just last week, I had a patient who was just so dyspneic, was not able to give a story, uh, but presented so short of breath. She was diaphoretic. Maybe she had a bit of chest pain, not quite clear. And she was just so dyspneic that she could not lay back in bed. And of course, we couldn't get an IV, we couldn't get any blood, uh, and we couldn't lay her down for an ECG. So no big deal, just brought out the POCUS and had a quick look at the heart and saw very poor systolic function, and I can go into that, into that. saw bilateral pleural effusions and diffuse V-lines. Couldn't have a look at her IVC, but to me, that essentially since the diagnosis and uh, without much further ado, we were able to give her some pre-load reduction and after-load reduction with some nitro spray and um, ACE inhibitors, got some nasal prongs on her. Finally, she settled, and then we were able to bring on the labs and the ECG. Totally agree. 
It's great for CHF. So that's just one of the many causes of shortness of breath. Um, how about pulmonary embolus? Uh -huh. That's a bit more tricky. I'm becoming a bit more hesitant to diagnose PE at the bedside, especially in the peri-arrest or cardiac arrest patient. Why that is, uh, is because of two things. So first of all, you have to be able to diagnose that, that there is RV dilatation at the bedside. And in doing so, uh, your apical four chamber view is, which is one of the most challenging views, is the view that you're going for. Because essentially, if you see an RV that's just about the size of an LV uh, or more, then that's RV enlargement. That's your first criteria. But you have to be able to tell whether or not this is an acute finding or not, in which case you have to do a sub xiphoid view of the heart to determine RV wall thickness. And if that's more than five millimeters, then you have to think of other underlying causes of RV strain, such as pulmonary hypertension or COPD. So this can be challenging in the acutely unwell patient. And not only that, uh, more studies. Um, especially in the swine models, are showing that not all RV enlargement equals PE. So we've seen cases of, um, especially in arrest, um, we've seen cases of RV enlargement uh, that was due to hypothermia or even V-fib arrest or even severe electrolyte abnormalities. Um, so I'm becoming a little more hesitant as I grow older about calling PE at the bedside if I don't have more convincing data points to do so. So essentially, I'm incorporating my ultrasound to help diagnose it, but I'm not going to make a call if um, this patient is not unstable. I'm not going to pull the lytics out if this is not uh, an arrest patient or a peri-arrest, in which case I'm essentially doing a Hail Mary by trying lytics. So I, I'm hearing you say that it's great for... Um diagnosing congestive heart failure versus, say, asthma or COPD. But beware in, in uh, pulmonary embolus because there are other things that can cause um, RV dilatation. Absolutely. But what about, say, um, pneumonia, and in particular, pneumonia in kids or young adults? Are you using it for that? Sure. So one way in which um, I use POCUS, um, where others may um, agree as well, is that if I've got the ultrasound right in my pocket, I'll pull it out, and I'm seeing this febrile tachycardic dyspneic patient, then essentially I'm starting antibiotics right off the bat. But the downstream care of things usually means that if this patient's getting admitted, they're still going to get a chest x-ray. So I'm not using it to spare radiation per se. I'm just using it to expedite my flow, do a bit of cognitive offload, um, and get myself moving to the next patient. Do you have a number two best yield? So you mentioned number one is the assessment of dyspnea. What would be number two? If I were to use POCUS, um, with regards to improving my accuracy, for instance, um, in terms of therapeutics, my number two would be for fracture reduction. The reason being that I use it almost on every other shift that I do, say if I'm on first aid for um, uh, my work at Lionsgate. And don't you remember the time whereby you thought, what the heck, why don't we have a C-arm at whatever hospital you work at? It just simplified fracture reduction and just made it way more finessed in terms of your treatments. Um, I remember one case when I was locoming at another hospital while I was on sabbatical and was attempting a reduction on a 17-year-old that did not go very well. Uh, but I thought it was okay because I casted it, but the post-reduction was terrible. Um, and so, of course, I had to go back, remove that cast, and give it a try again. But if you apply POCUS at the bedside, it just makes it much easier. So first of all, the, the way that I do this is I look at the bone to determine where I'm going to apply pressure at that distal fragment site. 
And number two, after uh, my attempt at reduction, I'll just confirm and see if alignment is good. Now, the caveat to that is I don't, I'm not able to check if there's any um, ulnar or radial deviation if we're talking about a distal radial fracture, uh, but at least I can check for dorsal angulation. So it doesn't mean that I'm not doing pre and post reduction x-rays. This is not like my diagnostic tool. It's my procedural tool to say, yes, alignment is good and great. Let's go ahead and put on that cast. And so far, I've never had to redo another reduction by using POCUS at the bedside. And just to be clear, you're using the linear probe for that? Yes, we can go into detail if you like, but in the short format, you're using the linear probe and you're following your fracture fragments before your reduction, just to have a look to see what the angulation is. And then during your procedure, you're having another look. And if you're not satisfied with your first attempt at reduction, then go ahead and try another redux uh, and keep doing that until you're satisfied with your alignment. Okay, so we've got number one is shortness of breath. Yes. We've got number two is fractures. Yes. And this will be my final question on the best yield POCUS studies. What's number three? Well, I feel this question is also dependent about on your patient population and where you work. But at another site where I work, abscesses and cellulitis are so common. It's your bread and butter every day. There's not a shift that will go by uh, whereby you'll diagnose either an abscess or a cellulitis. And using POCUS, again, with that linear probe, just takes the entire guessing game out of it. Um, it allows you to estimate the amount of fluid you're expected to withdraw and allows you to see the structures beneath that abscess that you definitely don't want to poke. So, you know, just the other day, I had a gentleman with a dorsal hand abscess. I could see very well those tendons and where I didn't want to poke through those tendons. So sometimes when I see really beautiful images that either you've generated or I see on the internet and I say, oh, well, for sure, I can see all the anatomy I want to see and I think I could make a diagnosis. But then I get myself to the bedside and I'm struggling with the view and I'm thinking, I can't get it to look as good as that. So I wondered if you could comment on some of the most common errors that novices or either people have been at for a while making image generation and things we can do to help improve those images. And also if you had any comments about specific image interpretation, although I think most people are getting pretty good at image interpretation. It's just tricks on image generation, I think are important. Sure. Let's talk about some image generation techniques. And the way I think of this is with regards to the patient positioning, the actual machine and the scanner him or herself. Um, so maybe I'll broaden up that uh, question to address those um, three different categories, um, which I feel generally help with this image generation. So first of all, for patient positioning, bed height is the number one thing. Don't make it difficult on yourself. Lower or lift up that bed and bring it so that scanning is a comfortable skill to acquire. Number two, drape your patient. Sometimes I'll come in and scan a patient that my colleague scanned and wants my input. And there are all these obstacles on the patient or either the patient is just fully unclothed, full of gel and just not draped. So be mindful of that. Have some towels and uh, cover up your patient, um, but remove those ECG leads, for instance, and clothes and jewelry that can get in the way. Just make it easier for yourself. With regards to the machine, things that I see very commonly in, um, especially learners, they like the depth. They just go all the way down until, you know, they can see the bed, basically. So just make it easy on their eyes for you and zoom in on that area. And when I say zoom in, I don't necessarily use the zoom function, but just decrease the depth so that your image is totally centered and it's just way easier to determine uh, things like aortic caliber or your gallbladder wall thickness. Um, the other error that I see very commonly is too much gain. And oftentimes this can happen when we're in a bright environment and the lights are full on. Um, so 
you know, it might mean an extra step to turn off those lights, but it just makes it so much easier to look at that screen and see the fine details um, and without having that image over gain. Because the tendency is if you're in a brighter uh, environment, you're going to gain up that image and it's just creating too much noise. It's like, um, you know, blasting the sound in a stereo. You, you just don't need all that noise to appreciate the music. You just want to turn it down so that um, you're at the right level. Stop right there. I've got to turn down Eddie Van Halen. I mean, I have to turn him down to appreciate him. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> just temporarily to fully appreciate the moment or the music, Eric. <laughs> the other error that is very common is just selecting the wrong probe for the wrong exam or even the wrong exam preset. Just make it easier by selecting the exact exam type that you want to do. For instance, the nerve block. You want to use that linear probe and you want to use the nerve exam to well appreciate that nerve. It's just the machine's designed and to optimize the settings necessary to visualize those different structures. And so it'll just be way easier. That nerve will pop out much more uh, if you're using an exam preset with nerve. Finally, if we have uh, a look at the scanner, him or herself, I think it's important to be ambidextrous. Oftentimes, um, you want to fit in the portable units uh, wherever there's the most amount of space in the room. So if it means rolling in the unit on the left side of the bed, it does mean that you're going to scan with your left hand and not your right hand. You don't want to be crossing over and trying to do your nebology while your probe is just sliding off the patient and you're trying to reach across to uh, turn down your gain or turn your depth down. So um, the best way to do it is have that machine such that the part of the body that you're touching with the patient um, is going to be the hand that's closest to the patient. I'll use a term that uh, Dr. Claire Heslop, who's a POCUS aficionado from UHN in Toronto, uses. She calls it dangling the probe like a dead rat. So if you can picture holding the probe, uh, you know, like you're holding a dead rat by the tail, that's not something you want to do. You want to use all the proprioceptive feedback by touching your patient and touching that probe. And so that allows you to keep your eyes on the screen while doing all your hand motion. And that's definitely something you can't do if you're crisscrossing your arms by um, scanning with the hand that's not closest to the patient. So holding the probe like a dead rat, though. Isn't that good for ch checking the reflexes, though? I mean, I think <laughs> that, that's the perfect kind of motion you want to get that knee-jerk reflex. <laughs> Whoever's paying for your probes at your hospital, Joe, will send you a bill for sure. If those crystals are just falling from those you're, probes, you're held responsible for that. You're the one who got rid of the stethoscope. I'm just <laughs> trying to... I'm trying to improvise here. That's all we're doing. Okay, so we're going to move into a, a few specific uh, kinds of uh, potential diagnoses. So what do you think about ultrasound versus CT scan for first episode possible renal colic? Let's give you a case. 65-year-old male comes in with right flank pain and he's you know it doesn't look that great pale he's sweaty he's got lots of right flank what are you thinking are you thinking is this ultrasound going to change your management or not and why okay i can give you the real life practice scenario type answer and then i can give you the evidence-based type answer why don't i start with some of the evidence so there is this randomized um, study that was published in this small paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, I think is what it's called, in 2014, whereby they randomized patients to either POCUS, including emergency department bedside ultrasound um, and radiology ultrasound versus CT in the diagnosis of patients that were thought to be renal colic. And then they looked at the adverse events 
um, and secondary outcomes such as, you know, ED length of stay um, and um, cost and radiation. Essentially, they found that there is no uh, serious adverse events um, that were missed significantly between the two groups. Um, and both modalities were great at diagnosing um, renal colic. So that's the take home. Now, my personal practice and the practice of my mentors from Ontario um, and other colleagues here is that if it's a first time episode, um, I'll do a POCUS for sure. If I can rule in hydronephrosis, great, but I'm still going to get a CT to diagnose this first time episode of renal colic. If on the other hand, we're talking about a repeat renal colic patient who's had numerous CT scans, feels like renal colic again, just got all the classic signs and symptoms, then my management changes in that if I can do POCUS and I'm ruling in moderate to severe hydronephrosis, then I'm not necessarily ordering another CT scan. Different shops may have different um, approaches or protocols for this. Um, it, I know, for instance, in my emergency department, uh, their urology service requests an XRKUB to monitor that stone in follow-up. So that's something that I may tack on. Um, but I'm not going to get a repeat CT scan in this person who already has renal colic. The caveat to that is the second question. Is your patient likely to pass this stone? Yes or no? Because then if this stone is, you know, more than eight, nine millimeters and they're likely to require intervention, the downstream service will likely want a CT scan to localize a stone and plan their interventions. But the sensitivity and specificity is good uh, for ultrasound and renal colic. And it's also really good for ruling out those other bad things like triple A's as well that are renal colic mimics. So I'm totally in agreement with you. I think it's an awesome thing. But for first time renal colics, especially in older people, I'm going with the CTKUB as well. I might just add, Joe, that uh, there is great specificity in ruling in hydronephrosis in those who have moderate to severe hydronephrosis. Not so great if it's just mild or barely visible. Um, and yes, you are right. Uh, there is great evidence to say that we can rule out AAA and rule it in um, using POCUS. I'll pick another topic then. What do you think the role is in appendicitis? <laughs> There are numerous studies out there that say, yes, there's great specificity um, in adults and in the um, children literature. Um, I've had a few, um, let's just say, experiences whereby I'm a little more cautious with this scan. And I'll give you a few examples whereby I was misled. So I did see a patient who came in with an outside ultrasound who had a diagnosis of appendicitis. So I thought, slam dunk, just talk to gen surge. I had a look at this um, patient myself with POCUS and thought that I saw like this report that he had in his hand, a blind ended non-compressible structure um, in the right lower quadrant with a bit of free fluids. The structure though was about 2.87 centimeters and it turned out to be the terminal ileum. So just be mindful that if you're seeing these huge structures, i.e. more than 1 to 1.5 centimeters, you have to question whether or not this is truly the appendix. The second case that I saw was not long ago, actually. Uh, I had a 30-year-old who came in, again, with right lower quadrant pain. It started classic. It was, you know, periumbilical, migrated to the right lower quadrant. I saw a bit of free fluid in the right lower quadrant. And in this context, I thought, this has got to be appendicitis. Um, I also thought I saw what was the appendix, measuring six millimeters or so. Do you have any idea what he ended up having? Uh, Crohn's? Nope. Guess again. Parasite? <laughs> <laughs> he had diverticulitis. So he had an inflamed cecum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Cecitis. 
<laughs> That's a diagnosis. Eric just really wants a diagnosis based on his name. So we've got to come up with something a bit better than that. All right. So I'm, I'm kind of with you on this is that um, I don't trust myself at all for doing ultrasound and appendicitis. And I've actually abandoned it. So that's just me. I don't know about you, Eric, but I've abandoned doing ultrasound for appendicitis. And I'll certainly order an ultrasound for appendicitis in young, thin uh, females. But for anybody else, I'm going to go with a, either it's a clinical diagnosis and I refer directly to surgery, or I'll just get a CT scan. What are you doing, Eric? I haven't been using an ultrasound just because if I hear that people who do a lot of ultrasound often have challenges with it, I think it would be... Uh, just wouldn't, it would be folly for me to say, okay, I can see that. Or that's a definite hot appendix on ultrasound. So no, I know where my limitations are, shall we say. So I'll pick one more little area in the belly that I've been using it routinely on, which is uh, gallstones and right upper quadrant pain and potential biliary colic. And I've been finding it great. You can see the stones, you can see the gallbladder dilatation, you can see gallbladder wall thickening, you can see pericholecystic fluid. What are your thoughts on that? Is that something that eMERGE docs should be routinely doing? What do you think, Green? Totally in agreement with that. It's such a classic presentation, super common, and a relatively easy scan to do as well. Um, one comment that I'll add as well is that how many times do you see Patients coming in the next day for their follow-up ultrasound and waiting for another eMERGE doc to reassess them post-ultrasound. It's such a common thing. So if we can spare that extra visit by having a look ourselves, then all the better. So essentially, we can look for this gallbladder in terms of cholelithiasis, question being yes or no, is, is there a gallstone or gallstones? And two, are there findings for cholecystitis? And we know that um, ultrasound for a rule in or rule out for cholelithiasis has pretty good numbers. Um, one study demonstrated high sensitivity, at least 90%, and 88% specificity for patients coming in with right upper quadrant pain, um, suspicious for biliary colic. The other one uh, that is very useful is to rule in cholecystitis because basically all you need is gallstones and a positive sonographic Murphy sign that you do at the bedside. And that gives you a really high predictive, uh, positive predictive value, essentially a 92%. So that's pretty much all you need to rule in cholecystitis. If you wanted to embellish that even more and you want to look for this gallbladder wall thickening or the pericholecystic fluid, then that just adds even more to your positive predictive value. So essentially, if I'm seeing gallstones on my bedside ultrasound and that sonographic Murphy sign is positive, to me, this is cholecystitis until proven otherwise in the right clinical context, of course. So, Karine, at our hospital, we haven't been having any um, any meetings with our heads of department for you know reappointment and stuff like that. So, I just got this message from our department head. He actually asked me to um, to do Karine's reappointment now. So, I've actually got some questions that I need to pose to Doctor Badra, just as a matter of maintaining her privileges at uh, at the Lionsgate Hospital. All right, uh, Doctor Badra, Tammy flu, yes or no? Yes. Which emergency colleague have you successfully bench pressed? <laughs> that would be, I believe I succeeded, Dr. Y. Ben Wong. That is correct. <laughs> Question number three A D dimer for acute aortic syndrome rule out, yes or no? Oh, yes, in addition to POCUS. Number four, please name the ingredients of your morning smoothie in decreasing order of antioxidant content. <laughs> okay, here we go. Kale, spinach, pineapple, mango, lime, ginger. What about liquid? It, it sounds like it's going to be like uh, viscous. 
you're not going to put your ultrasound probe gel in there just to, <laughs> just to kind of like like it pass down because i i actually think it would help at both ends don't you to, to get that smoothie down and get that smoothie out <laughs> number five what is the name given to the syndrome where the left iliac vein is compressed by the right iliac artery to cause a DVT in the left leg. Okay, wait, is this the Paget Schroeder or the May Turner? I think it's May Turner. May Turner is lower extremity, Paget Schroeder, upper extremity. I am boggled beyond belief that you nailed that. Well done, <laughs> well done. Uh, last question. You asked me about this question before, and you asked me if there would be any music questions. And, uh, well, I'm sorry, I lied. Ugh. So the Tragically Hip, are they from Kingston, Ontario, or from Bob Cajun, Ontario? Kingston, Ontario. Are you certain? 100%. It was in Bob Cajun. No! No! I saw the constellations reveal themselves one star at a time. Oh. No, you're right. It's Kingston. I just wanted to sing a little bit. Okay, phew. This could be the make or break question. Go ahead, Dr. Hager. <laughs> All right. Uh, which group did the soundtrack to Blade Runner? Oh, no. That's an Eric Angus <laughs> question. But it's not really a group. Oh, I'm not, I don't know. It's one person, one name. <laughs> I still don't know. Okay. It's got Who gel it? in it, gel. <laughs> <laughs> you see, it's the perfect ultrasound question because who is it, Joe? It's Vangelis. Like gel. Exactly. Vangelis. <laughs> <laughs> I fail my reappointment yeah. questionnaire. I'll, I'll pass on the findings to our department head, but thank you. That was it's very enlightening. Thank you very much. I know you wanted to talk about sort of tips and tricks. Is this the best time to do that, Corrine? I would say so. Well, I'm just going to let you take the stage. What are some tips and tricks that you've either developed yourself or seen other people do and things that you find are useful? I have some learning points throughout the years that I've um, seen learners, colleagues um, do that I feel that I should share um, because they're, in my mind, great learning points if you're wanting to save a life, for instance. Um, I'll give you an example of a patient that I saw when I was doing my fellowship in Ontario. Uh, in Toronto, this was the case of a 30 something year old woman who essentially collapsed at home and she waited to the very last minute to present to our department because she didn't have any health insurance. Some of the reported history included maybe some diarrhea, feeling unwell, and then collapsing and maybe having a seizure. So by the time she got to our department, uh, the emergency room physician who um, was supervising her resuscitation had a very wide differential. Um, and she had been intubated at this time because she was in and out of cardiac arrest. And he had done a bedside ultrasound. Um, he wasn't quite sure of what he was seeing in the pelvic area. Um, so at some point I rolled in and he asked me to do this ultrasound while he was chatting with the intensivist who was about to take over care. And in the meantime, um, studies were being done. Like she was about to go for a CT head because of this query seizure. They thought maybe this was a sort of toxidrome. In short, nothing was quite clear until I put the probe in the right upper quadrant, at which point I said, stop what you're doing, get gyne involved right now. Because what did she have? Ectopic pregnancy? She had a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. And the easiest way to see this was to assess for fluid in the right upper quadrant. And then I had a look in the pelvis and it was, yes, a bit complex to see because you couldn't quite make out that there was a pregnancy anywhere or an ectopic pregnancy. And there was a whole bunch of clotted blood, which kind of muddled the picture a bit. So what happened next? Gynae came down and did an ED laparotomy. At this point, she had ROSC and she was stable enough to undergo this procedure, um, but we got immediate care um, in the department. 
So the take home being, if you're going to look for free fluids in a patient who's unstable, just check the right upper quadrant. The pelvic views can be a bit confusing. Yes, go ahead and have a look at them if you want to have a look for an intrauterine pregnancy. But in this clinical scenario, just check out the right upper quadrant. So right upper quadrant is the best. Um, and I totally agree. But where's the second best place to look for free fluid? Uh, it would be the pelvis because it is the most gravity dependent um, area. We just don't do it that often. And it became uh, more of a common scan in just the latest years to look for that um, fluid in the pelvis. But even then, it can be muddled. We see the seminal vesicles that can be confounded for free fluids. So many things can be confounded for free fluid in the pelvis. So if you want your biggest bang for your buck, just go for the right upper quadrant. What do you think about the um, splenodiaphragmatic space? Yes, you should also look for fluid there. There was a study that was published that did demonstrate that um, in certain clinical scenarios, there was fluid found only in the left upper quadrant. And if I remember correctly, those were the cases of splenic lacerations. So I say don't neglect it, still have a look for it. Yeah, and I, I think the, I, I agree with you there. And I think the point is, is that you have to look at the splenodiaphragmatic space as opposed to the splenorenal space because it's more sensitive, I think. So, yes, we used to emphasize that subdiaphragmatic space. The study that I'm talking about, though, found it at the caudal tip of the spleen. And maybe it was inherent to this type of uh, presentation with the splenic lax. Um, I would just say stick to the basics or stick to those rules. Look at those three different areas in the left upper quadrant if you don't want to miss anything. So check that subdiaphragmatic area, six to nine o'clock. Check your splenorenal interface and check the caudal edge of that spleen. That being said, something else that I do want to add is essentially you're looking at a 3D model using a 2D modality. So the last step in looking for fluid in your scan is to sweep that interface. So don't skimp out on that area and have a one-shot look by just having a static image. Do a full sweep until the kidney disappears in both the right and the left upper quadrant. All right, next pearl. <laughs> next pearl that I wanted to share is, even if you don't have all that much ultrasound experience, the good news is about the human body, oftentimes there are two parts to it or two sides to it. And I'll give you an example of um, how doing one scan changed management for me by looking at the other body parts. Again, this is a case where I was working in Ontario and a colleague pulled me over to have a look at um, a child's hip. So why differential? This child had woken up one morning and was just refusing to wait there. A traumatic pain. And she was wondering, is this transient synovitis? Is this like calvi Is this, you know, a septic arthritis? What was going on? Basically, this child was extremely well appearing, very stable vital signs, uh, but had some very localized hip pain. And I was early on in my training, had no idea really what I was looking at, but gave it a shot. Had a look at that hip and thought, okay, something's a bit strange. Let's just check out the other hip. And I was able to get a baseline view of the normal hip and then compare that to the abnormal hip, which had a huge, complex, loculated effusion. So she had a case of... Well, it's not septic arthritis because the kid looks so well, but maybe transient sign of it is the hip. Joe, it was septic arthritis. But the kid was so well. Yes. Yes, indeed. But in the end, this child was transferred to sick kids and had this uh, effusion drained in the OR. So there you go. I say, even if you're not sure, if you don't have a colleague that you can just pull and um, get an opinion from, have a look at the other side just to compare. So the study that I have been trying to use this on is the testicles, because that's the other one in the middle of the night. 
some guy comes in with severe testicle pain. And that's the other one. You can compare two sides really easy. And I, I've been finding that somewhat helpful. Absolutely correct. Now, the scrotal ultrasound for torsion is a fairly good ruling, not a great rule out, even for uh, studies done in the radiology department. Um, so the caveat to that is, if you are having a look at one testicle and you see great flow and you compare the other one and there's no flow, then great. Put your probe down, detour that testicle. That happened to me once in Ontario. I was able to detour immediately and get flow back. That was one of the most satisfying moments. Um, but if you're trying to rule it out, it's a very challenging scan for a few reasons. One, you should be able to identify the arterial flow and put a Doppler in that testicular artery. And two, you also need to identify venous flow, uh, both of which can be challenging. Um, because if you can't see both of those, um, then you can't rule it out. Um, because there is such a thing as a torsion detorsion syndrome, whereby you could get some flow intermittently. So no matter what, for these situations, if I can't rule it in, I am definitely getting a radiology ultrasound to have a look. Um, and if the clinical suspicion is high, I'm on the phone with the urologist, no matter what time of day or night. Yeah, so that's a really good point. So if you see no flow or very little flow, then that's uh, that just makes you pick up that phone and get that urologist coming right now. But if you don't see it, you're not done yet. Exactly. Now, wouldn't you try to detour those testicles if, if you had evidence right there? Oh, yeah, of course you would. So basically, the way you detour them is you're, if you're looking at the patient from the head of the base of the bed, is you rotate them kind of like outwards, right? So the left hand and the right hand are kind of sweeping out. Yeah, you're doing the open book maneuver. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. 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 I had um, the urologist come down and ask me how I had done this procedure, how I had saved this patient's testicles. And I thought, well, we learned this in med school, open book, and it worked. And you can just confirm if it did work by, again, putting the probe on. Sometimes it requires more than one detorsion maneuver uh, because the testicles can be torted, you know, 760 degrees or whatever. Um, so give it a try. Again, if it hasn't worked with your single detorsion maneuver. That's really bad luck to twist around twice, I think. <laughs> that's actually been my experience. That's, that's, you usually have to go more than just one twist around to help them. So you've done this, Joe? Yeah. Wow. So... What you're saying is that if you've got somebody who's unstable, hypotensive, and you're thinking of a belly source, the best go-to spot is the right upper quadrant. And if you're ever in doubt about a specific study, if you can't find a colleague to bounce it off of, you should at least find the other side, the contralateral side of the structure you're looking at and compare the two. Well, those are good two pearls. I just thought of another one, Eric. Hocus for pulse checks. Oh, well, you know what? I, I'd heard a little bit about that, and I think there was some brief little paper written in Resuscitation last year. Hang on, I've got it here. Let me just flip through. Oh, what do you know? The author is a Kareen Badra. I think I've heard of her. <laughs> well, I'm glad you brought that up. Let's, let's hear about that, because having had just in the past two shifts, having two resuscitations, I was thinking about it. I was not doing it because... I didn't feel qualified or sophisticated enough to do it. So I did not employ that in my management. So a few ways in which uh, POCUS can be used in cardiac arrest um, and pulse checks. So when I say pulse checks, I do mean using the linear probe and having it either on the carotid or the femoral artery to verify a pulse. Because we know time and again, studies have come out saying, even as healthcare providers, we are very poor at determining the presence or absence of a pulse within a 10 second range. And if you can demonstrate this 
without relying on your proprioceptive feedback or your poor digital maneuvers to assess this pulse, then even better. And you can show your team members as well. Um, I can think of a case of a patient uh, who came in because he had collapsed. Uh, he may have been a bit short of breath, maybe he had some chest pain, some back pain. The story was not clear. And so in doing just a general POCUS assessment, I couldn't find any specific reason for his um, syncope and chest pain and shortness of breath. So of course, I sent him to the donut of death where he promptly arrested. And so excellent CPR was started by the healthcare team. And upon starting CPR, the patient started moaning and even seemed to have um, purposeful movements in trying to reach for his chest. And so team members were completely taken aback by this and would yell to stop CPR. But as soon as you stopped, the patient would go lifeless again. And so essentially, this was a case of uh, a patient in cardiac arrest whose cardiac output was just so well regenerated by CPR that he had um, some type of flow to the brain. But in true reality, he just did not have a pulse and did not have any cardiac function unless you had his heart beating for him essentially by doing CPR. So what I did was put the probe on the femoral artery and demonstrated to the team that, no, this patient does not have a pulse. We need to undergo CPR right now and not stop. So that's one way that I can um, verify pulse checks with patients in cardiac arrest. And sometimes the other way that I'll do this is just corroborate if somebody, if another team member, if you work in a center whereby you have the luxury of having several hands on deck, um, if somebody's actually checking for a pulse, I'm just going to corroborate that just to make sure that yes, there truly is a pulse or no, there is not. So that's one of the ways in which um, POCUS can be used in cardiac arrest. The other way, of course, is having a look either in the sub view or whatever real estate you have on the chest to see whether or not there is cardiac activity, yes or no. So that's helpful in determining one, um, diagnosis, and two, prognosis, um, because I'll get into the study that was essentially a landmark study published again in Resuscitation in 2016 by Gaspari et al. Um, they collected close to 800 patients in 20 different departments across the US and Canada and assessed patients who were in asystole or PEA in the pre-hospital environment or in the ED. And they had POCUS done to determine their outcome to discharge. So no surprise there. Patients who had cardiac activity were more likely to be admitted to hospital and more likely to be discharged at 30 days than those who had zero cardiac activity and in asystole. So essentially, those in asystole and no cardiac activity, there is 0.6% of them who survived to hospital discharge. And in which neurological state, we don't know. So it's not zero, but it's very low. Um, so that's how I integrate my POCUS in patients who are in cardiac arrest. Finally, the other integrative skill would be to look for the H's and T's that you can with POCUS. So um, looking for tamponade, looking for tension pneumothorax, looking for hypovolemic shock, and looking at that right upper quadrant. And with a caveat, maybe looking for um, signs of a PE. And I would add to our earlier discussion, Joe, that you're more likely to increase your chances of diagnosing a PE if you look for surrogate markers or for um, DVTs. So a very high likelihood ratio, I think one study was um, demonstrated that it was a likelihood ratio of 16 uh, if you did find DVTs. So um, you can incorporate that in your um, POCUS algorithm in cardiac arrest. Excellent. So sounds like you're keen to use the ultrasound probe for doing a probe pulse check as opposed to a manual pulse check in cardiac arrest. 
and also to check for cardiac activity to basically prognosticate what's happening as you're trying to resuscitate a very sick patient, and also to kind of verify the H's and T's that we sometimes run through when we're trying to decide as a cause for the arrest. Joe, I know you had a very specific question about using point-of-care ultrasound in trauma patients. Yeah. So um, for stab chests, so say you get stabbed in the cardiac box and the patient comes in in extremis or even in an arrest. And so they've got an organized rhythm on the monitor. They're in arrest. And you throw the ultrasound probe on and you do not see a pericardial tamponade, assuming you have a good look. Does, is that enough for you to not do a thoracotomy or would you pr- proceed with a thoracotomy in those cases? And I'll tell you why I'm saying that. This is my personal practice is that I think a thoracotomy is good if you have a tamponade, uh, but I don't have the skills to do a hyalur twist or to actually deal with anything else inside the chest. And it's risky to do a uh, thoracotomy in a stab chest. So if I see a tamponade, I'm going in. If I don't see it, um, and I clearly don't see it, then I'm usually not going in. So I wanted to ask your opinion on that. So what if you saw a tamponade and instead of doing an ED thoracotomy, which you know may not be accessible to all centers in BC and can be pretty overwhelming, what about a pericardiocentesis? Well, I have a strong opinion about this particular issue in that ED thoracotomies are actually relatively easy compared to a pericardiocentesis. And pericardiocentesis in acute trauma with the type of trauma that's causing an arrest aren't usually that effective, in my opinion. It's much better just to open up the chest and open the pericardium, and you might have some chance there. But I have not found pericardiocentesis in those who are in extremis to be of any use at all. Interesting, because my perspective would be, I would feel much more comfortable doing a pericardiocentesis in a patient who is truly in tamponade than an ED thoracotomy. So I feel that might be my go-to in preparation, maybe, for the ED thoracotomy, if it can reel in all the um, team members for that. Great. It sounds like a, it's, it's actually a really good point of debate, and hopefully our listeners could even give us their opinions on this particular issue, because I do feel quite strongly that ED thoracotomy is somewhat overdone, and that POCUS can really help us narrow it down and like to decrease the number of ED thoracotomies that are actually being done that are of relatively low yield, um, and the, 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 the role of pericardiocentesis in trauma anyways, is uh, is still, in, in the ones who are an extremist, is still kind of controversial, I, I think. So, I think we're actually getting to our last question for our rural colleagues and what sort of support we could give them or whether they could get any online support for either, you know, image interpretation or image generation. Um, so, Joe, imagine you're back up in uh, in back up north. I was in Inuvik. Yeah, let's say you're back up there again, and you've got this probe, and you're trying to decide which is the right side, the left side, whether it's up or down. You think it's a dead rat. You're not sure. <laughs> so, Kareen, what can we offer our rural colleagues who may not have, you know, access to either other colleagues to help them do scans? What do you think we could offer our colleagues as online support or sort of virtual real-time support? Absolutely. I'm just going to put a plug in for um, the Rudy project here, the Rural Urgent Doctor and Aid, uh, which is part of the real-time virtual support pathways uh, that BC has been offering. Uh, So you can always call a doc for some help. And among the list of physicians listed for the Rudy team, There are at least four who have great ultrasound experience um, that you can reach out to. So that's one way that um, further help can be um, gathered. Uh, The other way is, you know, handheld devices are becoming uh, more and more prominent and technology is evolving at an ever 
faster pace and the probes are just sprouting everywhere, basically. Um, so just to name a few, there's the butterfly probe, the uh, Lumify, the Clarius, all of which offer some form of telemedicine. Not, of, not all of those services are free. I know for one that the Lumify offers a support network that is free within the first year of joining. Um, I'm not quite sure what the cost is. I think it's $80 a year thereafter. But at any rate, um, if anybody owns one of these probes, they have access to some live telemedicine help. Maybe I could make a comment. Some of the ultrasound machines, you can actually plug your, your cell phone in and you can record the image that way. Or you could even just take a video of what you're seeing on the screen, and you could send that video to whoever you're talking to on the phone. Correct. I would say, though, that this is very helpful for image interpretation if you wanted to um, just run those scans by a colleague. But really, the I, I think the challenge number one is image generation. That's always the one that's going to be a bit more tough, because once you've got the image, typically it's easier to interpret than to actually get there. You know, before COVID, we had a whole bunch of courses available across the country, and those are, of course, on hold until um, further notice. But more and more, we're trying to come up with either some AI or some virtual type support. For instance, I know that there is a house course that was given in a more virtual format um, in Fort Nelson recently. and it's, it takes quite a bit of skill to be able to, one, look at the scanner's hand to determine the hand motions that need to be done in order to generate the perfect picture. So it takes a lot of teaching skills to get to that kind of level of teaching. Okay, so this has been a great session. It certainly seems like it's one of the more dynamic fields in medicine, and I don't know, hardly a week goes by when I don't either get some sort of a tweet or a note saying that, hey, look at this cool image I found, and hey, I'm using this now, and hey, now I'm using this to place radial art lines, and so it's just, it's creeping into all facets of clinical medicine. Hey, can I add just one more thing? Let's hear it. I just want to add a final word to wrap up this session. Essentially, I'd say as a take-home point to the learners, it would be to use the ultrasound as an extension to your physical exam, incorporating it as a data point and not just using it independent of everything else. Yeah, it's a super good point. And don't let the ultrasound screw up your flow in the department either. So that that would be another point. (laughs) Hey, Joe. That's yeah. also why you need a probe in your pocket. Ah, yes, good point. And we actually have that now, and we're taking it up to all our cardiac arrests now, too, up on the wards. So we, we bring them with us. Strong work. Strong work, indeed. All right, thanks again, Corrine. Time to wrap it up and call it a day. Thanks for tuning in. Feel free to post your comments and feedback on the BC Emergency Medicine Network website, bcemn.ca, and take a moment to check out the Clinical Resources tab with its clinical summaries and procedural videos, and visit the lounge to join in on member discussions, open up blogs, and access the End of Shift podcast library. Thanks to the network, and especially to Carolyn McKinnon, our editor extraordinaire. Until then, keep your differential wide and go play outside.